Welcome everyone joining the uh, workshop today. Uh, today's workshop is presented by uh, Homeowner CSF. And uh, today's topic that we're going to talk about is uh, how much it, uh, can I afford? And it's presented by me. My name is Chi Chu Ling. I go by Chu and then I'm from SF LGBT Center. And also we do have the Kitty Lee joining us and she's from the Wells Fargo Home Mortgage. So today we're going to present uh, this workshop and you know provide some uh, additional information uh, for everyone. All right, so um, the next slide. Um, so, you know, if you guys join uh, using the computer or either using the uh, mobile phone, you can uh, do the uh, caption. You can turn it on or turn it off. So if you join using the laptop, uh, you will able to see the little um, doggo on the bottom on the uh, left side is uh, um, CC, you can do that. And then you also can translate to the language like you, you uh, if it's the English is not your first uh, language, okay? And then if you join using the mobile phone, you also able to do that. Just click the uh, captions and then you can, you know, enable show the captions and then you can also choose the language, okay? All right, and then let's do the next one. Um, all right, so um, the first, uh, today, first organization I'm going to introduce you guys is a home ownership SF and uh, member agencies. So, you know, uh, home ownership SF is a nonprofit uh, home ownership uh, service provider. So, uh, home ownership SF is served as a centralized resource for the affordable uh, home ownership opportunity in San Francisco. And also, uh, they are uh, uh, correlating of five San Francisco basics housing uh, counseling agencies. So you can see on the screen, there's uh, uh, Aging Inc, Balance, MedUp, and SF LGBT Center, and as well as the SFHDC. So all five uh, agencies, they are all provide like uh, first time home buyer program counseling section, and also they provide the rental assistance as well. So this is something that if you need assistance, you can reach out to all the agency to get support and you know they can uh, help you with any uh, housing um, issue or housing um, assistance. All right, and then the next one. All right, and now let's talk about the uh, housing counseling. So, um, I presented from uh, San Francisco LGBT Center. So let me quickly introduce what the center uh, offer. So we have some core services. We do have a home ownership counseling and we do rental counseling as well. And we also have another program called uh, Sama Mati Coaching. And then we do the debt and budget counseling as well. And also the credit report review. So this is something that if you um working under uh, buying a home if this is the your goal you can reach out to us to schedule a counseling session to go over um, your options and also if you want to like say if you don't have credit right now or if your credit score is not really good you can't you want to improve it you can reach out to us we can refer you to the smart money coaching to um, help you with that as well okay and this is a phone number and the website you can visit and to connect with us all right, the next one, let's talk about the uh, uh, four C's of credit. So when it comes to credit, there are four C's. And it's very important. That is something that uh, you need to, you know, get ready. The first one you can see is a character. So the, the character, this is the lender want to know that, you know, uh, in the integrity that the borrower has paid their loans. So this is something that uh, when you request a, uh, loan or pre-approval, lender will check your credit report to see, hey, if you've been paying your bill good or if you having a like good credit history. The second one is a capacity, that is a cash flow to pay a loan. So for the capacity, this is something that, you know, the lender want to know if it, the borrower has sufficient cash flow to make the monthly payment of the new loan. And they will check your uh, current pay stops and at least last three years tax return to see, hey, what's your capacity looks like. And then the third one you can see it's a, oh, can you go back to the slides, previous one? Sorry, Alex, <laughs> the previous one. Yeah, the, the four Cs, all right. And then the third one that you can see is a capital. So the capital that's a investment, the down payment plus closing costs and reserve. So capital, this is the lender, they want to see that, um, if it's a borrower, they have saved enough money to put down the down payment and also have enough like at least 
two to three months uh, mortgage payment reserve and the closing cost. And then the collateral that is the property value sufficient to uh, secure the loan. So the collateral, this is lender want to know that if the property that they are going to be lending for, um, is, if it's a worth investment. So they will send an appraiser and also require a certain inspection of the home. Okay, so that's a four C's. All right. Now let's talk about uh, next one is a credit. So um, a credit score and credit history determines your interest rate and down payment requirement. So you know there are three main credit bureaus out there. The first one is Experian, and then Equifax and the uh, TransUnion. So the mortgage lender typically use the mixed score. So that means, let's say if you do have three uh, different credit scores from that three bureaus, and then they will use the mid one. So for example, if your, uh, let's say if your experience is 720, and then your Equifax is 730, and then TransUnion is 750. So that means then they will use the mid one. That means the 741, that will be the one that they use. Okay, um, some loan products might have additional term for the requirement uh, triggering by the credit score and history as well. All right, and then the next one, let's talk about check your credit. So, you know, um, just make sure that you tracking your credit score. Um, I know right now a lot of mobile banking, you are able to enroll it to see a credit score. So a lot of, uh, if they will send you the, monthly update to see hey, what's your credit score and then you are able to see it's going up or going down so just make sure that you keep tracking it and also you can you know put out a credit report as well to check your uh credit make sure everything information on there is good and there's no any error if it, you do see there's some information is outdated or it's not correct information you can dispute it that to your credit report, make sure your credit report is correct, okay? And that is something that if you do put out your credit report, if you do see there's something incorrect, you can, you know what to do, you can reach out to us and then we can uh, help you to you know, file the distribution as well. All right, so that's a credit. Now let's talk about the next one, live with your budget. So this is something that when you want to get in the mortgage, you have to, you know, kind of, no, hey, what if I carry this mortgage with my main income? If it's a doable after you pay for mortgage, HOA, and all the expense. So you have to purchase living on your future payment and save the rest of it for down payment. So uh, you can make end meet. So better to know before you commit to the 30 years long, okay? Especially if it, let's say, uh, you using the city's program to buying a home, and then I always require you to do a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. Okay, so this is something that your lender and the counselor can help you to calculate purchase price and that you can afford. Okay, all right, and then this one, let's talk about the cost of the home ownership. So, you know, when you going to buy a home, uh, there's something that you will need to pay. There are a uh, one time payment, and also there's a uh, there are some ongoing payments. So let's take a look at upfront payments. So when you're buying a home, that's something that you have to uh, prepare. The first one you can see is a down payment. And it depends on the lender, depends on the programs. Sometimes the minimum down payment requirement is 3%. Some lender minimum down payment might be 5% or 10%. Or this is something that when you're working with the lender, you, you will able to know. And then the second one is closing cost. We know when you're buying a home, there's a lot of fee you have to pay and that will include that will listing in the closing cost. That is something that you need to prepare as well. And then you will need to set up the escrow account as well to you know prepare for the property tax and insurance, that kind of uh, stuff you have to prepare in that escrow account. And then reserve. So uh, when you're buying a home, after you pay for closing cost, after you pay for a uh, uh, down payment, and then a lot of lenders, they want to see that you still have some reserve in your liquid asset or in your retirement account. Usually that is a, a, around three to uh, two to three months reserve that they want to see. Just in case, you know, once, once you become the homeowner, if something happened, you're still able to come out with like a few months uh, mortgage payment to pay for the, uh, your mortgage. And then the other one is the moving cost. That is another one as well. And then I'm going, that is going to be your mortgage payment because you carry a mortgage, right? So you cannot continue paying your uh, mortgage payment. Tax and insurance as well. So that's something that you will need to pay. And if you purchase a condo with the HOA, then you will need to pay HOA fees as well. And also including the utilities and then also maintenance and repairs. So 
uh, you can see the very button here. It says the lender determines the maximum loan amount, but you determine how much you can afford. Like I said, uh, when you request a, a loan, right? So lender will base on your income and they will come out with like, hey, what's the maximum that they can lend it to you? But the maximum amount, it doesn't mean that you are able to afford it for that. Because remember, when you pay your mortgage, you pay your pay mortgage, not paying from your gross income is paying from your net income so just make sure that your net income is enough to cover your mortgage payment and also to cover your other housing of uh, other expense and then not you know not go your budget do not go minus every month so that's the issue all right and then the next one all right and um, let's talk about uh, what is the piti so um Suggest housing cost not to exceed thirty three percent of the monthly gross income for the PITI plus MIA. So PITI stands for the principal interest taxes insurance and then mortgage insurance and HOA. So just make sure that hey, your um cost uh housing cost do not exceed thirty three. But there are some exceptions though. So let's say if you do the cities program either the next. Like, uh, BMR program or down payment system program, usually they want to see it's around like 28% between your uh 40%. So this is something that if you continue with the purchase, a uh, council will able to help you to run the number. They will, you know, create a spending plan and run a uh, scenario to carry the mortgage to see, hey, based on your gross monthly income, if you buying the property that you want to buy with that price and then to to see hey, what your mortgage looks like, if that is doable or not. So this is something that you can reach out. Lender also can do that for you as well. So just make sure that you reach out them and then make sure you the home you're buying is doable with your budget. Okay. All right. And then the next one, let's see. <sighs> So now let's talk about the property test. You know, once you become a homeowner, you're responsible for the um, property tax, right? So usually property tax, you can see how they do the property test is, hold on, give me one second. All right. Um, it's the assessed value. So, and then multiply the tax rate, usually it's about 1%. And then plus the local assessment. So there's a fee or liens, and then that will equal the property test due. So when we talk about the property test, you know, once you become a homeowner, usually uh, the assessors, they mail the taxpayer a notice uh, assets value, usually it's every month around July. And then in the every every year, not every month, sorry, every year around July. And then in the September, the property test rate approved by the board of the supervisor. And then November 1st, that is all the taxpayer will receive the property tax bill. And then uh, they are, you can make a two payments. The first one is a deadline is December 10th. Uh, that is the payment for the first in installment. And then the next year, April, that is the second installment deadline for you to pay for property tax. Okay. All right. And then the next one, let's talk about the um, impound account. All right. So... So, you know, once you uh, ca carry a mortgage, you uh, you will, so when you pay for property tax and pay for the home insurance, there are two common ways that you can pay. The first com uh, the first way that you can do is open an escrow account, then you prepare your property tax and home insurance to the escrow account. And then when you receive the bill, you, you can just pay out from your escrow. The second way to pay is to pay by yourself, that, but that is not that, common that people do that. Most people, when it comes to the paying the tax and the insurance, they open an escrow account, and then, you know, they just prepaying every month a certain amount to that account, and then save there, and then just pay out from your escrow account. So an account um, maintained by the mortgage company to pay housing related expense, for example, annual property taxes, annual hazard insurance premium and the mortgage insurance uh, premium. And the uh, HOA is not included, okay? So when you are buying a home, if it's a uh, home, if there's a HOA, you usually gonna receive two different separate bills. The first one is a mortgage payment. And then the mortgage payment is gonna be the, you know, principal interest and also the property tax and the uh, home insurance that you prepaying. And then the HOA bill, that will be, you will receive it from the property management. That will send you the separate bill to pay for that. Okay. All right. And then now next slide. Now I'm going to turn over to our 
Um, another prisoner, uh, she is a uh, uh, Kitty Lee from West Fargo. All right. <laughs> Kitty, you mute it. You mute it. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Great, yes. thank yes. you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, just a really quick one down, just to intro on myself. My name is Kitty. I'm a home mortgage consultant for Wells Fargo Home Mortgage. I was with Wells Fargo about 20 some odd years ago and we joined Wells Fargo in 2018. So banking and mortgage is definitely in my blood. Sometimes I get a little bit excited so if you guys have any questions, save that until the very end. But I'm going to try not to read you everything on the slide because we all can read. I'm trying to kind of give you some real life examples. Um, and by the way, I know I mentioned that I've started doing this, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Just to clarify, I started working when I was six years old. Okay, so 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 don't, don't spread any rumors out there. But anyway, um, so let's go to the next slide, please, if you don't mind. So let's talk about different loan options. Now, keep in mind, what we're going over, it's really just a very general overview. It's not exactly the same. Each lender has different uniqueness. And as the industry, as the economy changes, sometimes we have extraction, sometimes we have expansion to the policies. But in general, when it comes to mortgage, residential mortgages, one to four units, we have two different groups, conventional and government insured. Conventional, typically, ideally, you can put 20% down, but it is not required. Under conventional loan program, you can put as little as 5%. Now, this 5%, I'm going to have you put an asterisk because there are lenders, including Wells Fargo, that will now allow you to put as little as 3% down, okay, under conventional. Keep in mind, when you have less than 20% down, typically, you are required to pay monthly something called private mortgage insurance, which stands, which again, you hear us talk about PMI, which is private mortgage insurance. It is an insurance that you as the homeowner pay to insure us, the lender, in case of default, the insurance company is going to compensate us in case of default. Because at the end of the day, credit and mortgage, it's really about risk assessment and risk uh, management. The less down payment you have, unfortunately, is a higher risk of default, or e even if you are the same risk of default, let's say you buy a house for 500,000 and you put you know, $50,000 down versus somebody who puts $200,000 down. Well, both of you, both two homeowners with the same house with different down payments, just for some reason lost their jobs and cannot make the mortgage payments. And Wells Fargo has to foreclose on those two properties. Chances are, with attorney fees, with maintenance costs and all that, we may not be able to sell the house for the client who bought for $500, only $50,000 down and sell that house for four fifty dollars or higher. Whereas the client who bought this house for $500,000, put $200,000 down, borrow three hundred dollars from us, in case that person goes into default, there's a good chance that we will actually make a money back. And hence the private mortgage insurance is needed when you have less than 20% down. And to piggyback on what Chu said earlier with regarding the impound account, in the state of California, you are required to sign up and set up the impound account to have your taxes and insurance be combined with your monthly mortgage payment when you put less than 10% down. When you put more than 10% down, the impound account is not required. Okay. The second option or the second, I guess, tab or classification is the government insured which are FHA and VA. VA is very simple, uh, military owner-occupied transactions only. And the benefit of that is zero money down and essentially zero closing costs for military. I don't do a whole lot of VA in our area. I'm particularly here in San Francisco and in the peninsula, just because of the home prices and how competitive the market is. VA tend to have a little bit of a stigma Seller seems to dislike VA loans just because there's lo no money down. There's no room for errors. Then the second government loans that we offer, it's called FHJ. It's as little as 3.5% down. Now, what is the difference between conventional and FHJ? FHJ was created, I don't know how many, 30, 40 years ago, really to help with first-time home 
buyers who may not have the 20% down and who may not have the perfect credit. So the credit appetite and also what I call that the, um, the threshold with conventional, you may have to have a little bit higher credit score. With FHA, the credit score requirements is not going to be as high. The interest rate right now, the FHA has lower interest rates if you compare just the 30-year fixed. However, FHA has two PMIs, upfront PMI and the monthly PMI. The upfront PMI, you have to pay that upfront. You can finance that into the mortgage. And the monthly PMI is something that you have to pay for life of the loan. Again, there's not a one it's better than the other, it really depending on your situation. So the best thing to do is to sit down with a mortgage consultant with an expert just to analyze your situation and see which loan program fits your needs. So let's go to the next slide, please. Perfect. Pre-qualification. So obviously we're gonna go ahead and do a very quick and dirty kind of pre-qualification with this presentation. But essentially, we're going to use something called debt to income ratio. When you meet with one of us, uh, we're so used to this terminology, we're going to, you're going to hear your loan consultant referring to DTI, debt to income ratio. Essentially, it's your ability to repay. And that is expressed in a percentage point, just like how Chu said earlier, the 33%. Each loan program will have its own requirement. Some will be higher at 50%, some will be lower. So okay, again, it all depends. It's, it's expressed in a ratio, a percentage, what your monthly payment is, and we can calculate your down payment amount, and we can calculate your maximum purchasing power. Now, when it comes to ratios, this is kind of old school, but essentially it's still around where we have two ratios. One is the front housing ratio. Simply put, your PITI, which is your principal, interest, property tax, insurance, and HOA, divided by your gross monthly income. It becomes your front end ratio. And your back end ratio, which is what we usually go by, is your PITI, your housing expense, plus all the debt that shows up on your credit report. And it's very key to mention that, for example, if you are a parent and you have, you spend $2,000 on childcare, that childcare is not listed on your credit report and that expense is omitted from your debt to income ratio calculation. Um, but typically what will be included with the quote unquote other total debt will be your car payments, your credit card payments, um, maybe a timeshare that you bought and you're financing it, anything that pretty much shows up on your credit report, right? Let's go to slide number 17, please. So again, this is a very, very general, a generic calculation. Each situation is quite unique, but you guys can kind of play around. We have another slide after this to kind of give you some specific scenarios how you will calculate manually on your own. But what I would still do is to still contact, pick up the phone and talk to one of the mortgage consultants because each loan program would have different debt to income ratio requirements. So I'm gonna go ahead and Alex, can you please skip to uh, slide number 18? Perfect, so number 18. So let's go ahead and play role play. Let's say this person makes about 100,000. So let me do my calculator. This person makes $100,000 a year. So your gross income is 83.33. Oh, by the way, in our world, we always calculate everything before tax. So it's gross income. One thing you have to be mindful of is that um, if you are in, if you your job, your compensation includes something called, we call discretionary income, like tips, commissions, or overtime, what we do is that we, we take your base, which obviously we can calculate, either you're an exempt employee or your hourly wage employee, but those discretionary income like overtime, we always use a two-year average in the past. Unfortunately, if you say, hey, Kitty, I just switched to a new job. Um, I used to be an exempt employee, and now I am an hourly wage employee, but I should make more money because, you know, with this job, I'm expected to make more money because of overtime. With 
Without the two-year history, unfortunately, it will be difficult for any lender to even give you an I to calculate your debt-to-income ratio using an overtime because we have no idea what your overtime income is. So I kind of, again, I want you guys to be mindful of that is, yes, we use the gross income, discretionary income, you need someone to sit down and calculate whether or not we can use those. So going back to this slide, you make 100,000 gross a year, your monthly gross income is 8333. At 33% max housing ratio, that number becomes 2750. And if you have a back end debt to income ratio, that's 3750. Let's say you have a car payment and the car payment is about $500 a month. What you do, you actually subtract line four from line three, you come up with 3250. And the maximum loan amount, you can see the calculation is 413. And how do we come up with that? Alex, can you go back to slide number 17? And I don't know if the participant will actually get that link. It's you can actually go in and click on this link and be able to plug in the numbers. And I, it, Alex, I wonder if this is interactive. No, guess not. Okay. My apology, because I don't have control of the screen, but ideally, if you plug in this, you're going to go to slide number 18, and you can actually, the, the system will calculate for you um, at the prevailing rate of 7%, and you kind of come up with a 413,000 maximum loan amount. So yes, I just one put the, yeah, go ahead. sorry to interrupt. I just put the link into the chat. So if, uh, if uh, you know, you want to uh, click the link and you go on to, on the, you know, on their website, you can do the estimate yourself. Perfect. 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 Right. Let's go to, yeah, perfect. Let's stay on this. One thing that I would again stress, this is a very, very simple, quick and dirty, loosely calculation. What is not included in here, again, is, well, what if I make overtime income and I just started this job? Well, you cannot use it. This does not include the property tax, insurance, and HOA, right? So you have to kind of account for that. Um, it also doesn't, you know, HOAs can vary from $300 a month to $1,000 a month, depending on what you buy. Um, there are some programs that will allow no more than 43% debt to income. Some programs will allow up to 49%. So what I did is that, you know, at the end of the day, what I would suggest to do, and this is my first consultation with a first-time home buyer, doesn't matter what Kitty says, doesn't matter what Wells Fargo says, you guys have to decide right now, how, what is the maximum monthly housing expense you're willing to pay? So if you pay only $1,000 or 1500 a month, Imagine if you were to go ahead and buy this house, what is the max you can afford? So I usually ask the customer first, if the customer said, Kitty, I can afford 3,500. Then I calculate backwards with the down payment that they have with the current interest rates, with the area they're probably looking at and the average HOA dues if they're buying a single, uh, excuse me, if they're buying a condominium or townhouse to come up with that you know, dollar amount that they prefer to be in. And of course, oftentimes the customer will be on the lower end side. Then I would usually go back to them and say, great, well, if I twist your arms a little bit, if you can just step a little bit on your budget, this is what you can buy. So I would say it's definitely an ongoing negotiation, not so much with me, but with yourself, with your budget. So I would suggest before you meet with one of us is to sit down, if you're buying this house with, uh, a spouse with a partner or even a family member, sit down, look at your finances every single month and see what is the maximum you guys can afford. Because at the end of the day, it is not me making the mortgage payment, it is you, right? So let's go to slide number 19, please. So mortgage ready. What is, is your credit score? Where does it need to be? Do you have enough safe or down payments? Do you have two year history? So those are kind of the things that we as a lender would like you to have a perfect credit. We would like you to have 20% down. We would like you to be in your job for the last two plus more years. Doesn't mean that if you don't possess all these bullet points, you will be denied a credit, uh, a mortgage. The answer is no. 
it, it varies, right? So what I tell my customers are usually there are three pillars we look for. Credit, which is, again, how well you manage your finances. Second is the ability to repay, which is expressed in a percentage of debt to income ratio. And the third pillar will be equity. Sometimes I call that skin in the game. If you have all three pillars taken care of, you meet the minimum down payment requirement, you meet the minimum credit score requirements, and you have maintained good credit, in general, you should still be approved. So two-year history, ideally, yes, we would have that. How else do you pay off? You reduce your monthly debt. That's something that we look at. Um, and your savings and your savings record, are you documenting? Um, because I'm of Chinese descent, I can say this. One thing I would caution a lot of our first-time home buyers or any home buyers for that matter is please stay away from cash transactions. Unfortunately, when you apply for mortgage, not just with Wells Fargo Bank, you may be living underneath a microscope for a little while because we're going to go through, comb through your two months bank statements. We're going to comb through your last two years W-2 and pay stubs. And with cash deposit, sometimes those cash deposit, depending on the size, may be omitted from your total balance. To give an example, let's say you have about $10,000 in your checking account. And last month you deposit $5,000 into it and it's 5,000 is shoebox money. Even though it's your money, everything is such it. Some lenders, including us, may omit that 5,000 because we cannot trace that back. So I wanna caution you is that, you know, those are the things that, you know, again, you're not breaking the law, but when it comes to mortgage lending, we have a different type of guidelines and rules. Okay, and let's go to page 20. So, Let's talk about the last bullet point, the difference between pre-approval and pre-qualification. Pre-qualification would be, let's say Alex calls me up and say, hey, Kitty, I'm thinking about buying a house. Great. Do you have 20 minutes? Then I, in the 20 minutes, I'll go over verbally what he tells me he makes, go over what kind of debt he, he actually owes, his budget, the area that he's targeting. And then over the phone, I can loosely calculate his eligibility, kind of like using the chart that we saw earlier in that grid, but it's a little bit more detailed. No credit checked, nothing at all. It's just over the phone pre-qual, giving the ideas, giving the customers the idea of where they stand in terms of the purchasing power. The next step is for them to submit a loan application. I'm only going to speak with Wells Fargo process because I don't know other banks process. With us, you just submit an application online depending if you apply individually or jointly. If you apply individually, we allow you to pull a soft credit check. If you apply with one other or two other people, then we do a hard credit check. From that pre-approval, based on what you enter on the application as your income, as your asset, we will be able to use that, generate a pre-approval letter, and you can use that pre-approval letter with the offer that you present to the sellers. Some of you may be a little bit more, I guess, involved in the home buying process, may have probably have bid in a few homes. There's a terminology out there, we call that fully underwritten pre-approval. That is not on this slide. Imagine that it's one step beyond pre-approval. The pre-approval is computer generated. You tell me how much you make, you tell me how much money you have in the bank, but it's not validated by an underwriter. The fully underwritten written pre-approval is you take that, pre-approval, the same credit report, and you supply us with your pay stubs, W-2s, bank statements, and everything as if your offer has been accepted by the seller. And we then send that in to the underwriter for the underwriter to approve you up to a certain dollar amount that you put on the application. So at that moment, what you have is a fully underwritten pre-approval. Now, there are several benefits. The benefit is that one, Take the risk element out of this whole equation. You know that you can qualify for X. There's no if or buts. Secondly, in a competitive offer situation, you may be asked to submit a non-contingent offer, meaning that there's no safety net. You're buying this house. You know you can get financing. There's no contingency to obtain financing. And of course, you want to make sure that you, you are fully qualified. So you submit this. 
Then another benefit is that sellers in a competitive offer situation oftentimes prefer a client who is fully underwritten versus someone who is just pre-qualified or pre-approved, right? Imagine if you were the seller, you have two competing offers. One person gone through the underwriting process, the other person just kind of did a simple pre-qualification. Oftentimes you're gonna pick the one that actually have gone through the underwriting process. And another benefit for having the fully underwritten pre-approval is that it allows us to close your transaction hopefully sooner than your typical 30 days because we did all the dirty work up front. We collected all your paperwork up front. Once we get into contract, all we need to do is to order the appraisal, maybe verify the condo is, it's a lendable condo, obtain insurance on the house. And we did all the all the guest work up front. So again, sometimes sellers prefer a faster close because they may have been in a contract to purchase another property already. So that's kind of the differences between pre-qualification, pre-approval, and fully underwritten pre-approval. Next slide, please. So pre-approval is just a calculation. You have to be able to make the payment. Like I said earlier, it really doesn't matter what Wells Fargo says. It's about you, right? Um, have you been living on your new budget? So another trick that Kitty asks our, my homeowners, my potential homeowners, especially first, first time home buyers, if after the consultation with me and we determine that your total housing expense, if you were to buy right now, is $6,000, including tax, insurance, and HOA, the whole shebang, and you're only paying $2,500 a month for rent, I'm going to say before you even apply, each month, I don't care if you eat ramen noodles, I don't care if you eat spam, you're going to go ahead and force yourself to save $3,500 a month and you set that into a savings account. By doing that, it will train you and actually kind of condition you into getting used to making that $6,000 mortgage payment. And if you're so uncomfortable with, with it after two to three months and you hate it, well, maybe you need to adjust where you want to buy. Maybe you're happy just renting for the time being until you're ready to purchase, right? And another benefit of doing that is obviously it forces you to save. So hopefully by the time you're ready, three months, four months, or even six months from now, you have a little bit more savings. So I again, I always ask my customers, whatever the, the monthly payment is, set aside that monthly payment. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end. You know, let's see. Uh, let's see. Have you paid your pay off your debts? Are you looking for planning? Okay. So I think that's pretty much it. Alex, next slide, please. So for complete list, here are the, the website, phone number, and so forth. Yeah. Thanks, Kitty. You're it's, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so um, this slide uh, you can see this home bio workshop. So uh, you know you can find a complete this San Francisco home bio workshop and the city assistant program at the homeownershelf uh org. So you are able to find all the uh there are some uh homeownership. There are some uh different um categories. You can find the renters, home buyer, or you are homeowner. You also can find all the workshop and information there to continue. You know to know more um the topic that you interest. And also you can contact the homeownership SF like using this phone number or email and for further information as well. All right, and next one, I'm going to uh, invite you guys. So, you know, uh, homeownership SF, they are uh, doing a, um, wish, not workshop, I'm sorry, doing an event on the, this Saturday. So it's from 10 a.m. to the 2 p.m. So uh, you guys are uh, welcome to join the, the event and it's going to be at the uh, Leola Howard uh, Early Education School. So the ages is going to be the 1520 Oakdale Avenue. So I'm going to post the uh, location. So you guys, if it is Saturday, you guys are available. You guys will come to join the Home Share Self uh, Housing Expo. Okay, uh, let me put the website to the group. Uh, not location right um alex uh there's someone asked if it, we cannot make it it will be a recurring saturday 
So Saturday is in person event. Uh, there's no recording for Saturday. Uh, in person event, there's a resource fair and the help center. We encourage all of you to join the in person. Uh, right. event on this Saturday. So we got the you got to meet the really uh you know it's uh, industry uh professionals and connections. Uh, you know get help immediately help from the help center. All so right. that's really big event. Uh, please um you know spread the word if your friends families want to go please. Let's go on this Saturday. All right. Um, I do see in the chat, uh, Timothy, it's a say there's a missing, uh, a say 2% every year on the property tax. Uh, I want to see that size again. Yeah. So, uh, Kitty, would you mind, uh, just, uh, to, uh, to sure. explain a little bit of that? So, the property tax at the time of underwriting and approval, all lenders, including Wells Fargo, will assess or kind of estimate how much your property tax is because we need to do that to calculate your debt to income ratio. Keep in mind that dollar amount is not fixed because each year the county will go out, the county's assessor's office will go out and reassess the value of your property. So if your property tax is $5,000 a year, the first year, doesn't mean that 5,000 will stay constant. It is typical for that to go up 2% per year. We did see, I don't know, maybe about 12, 13, 14 years ago with a mortgage meltdown where home prices drop. And so that was kind of an odd event where you actually didn't, we did not see home, the real estate or the, the property tax went out. We actually saw property tax went down. But typically, you should expect that property tax payment to go up slightly per year because of the reassessed value. All right. Thank you, Kitty. You're welcome. All right, so now let's move to Q&A. Um, if you folks, you have any question, uh, you know, welcome to jump in the chat or in the Q&A, and then uh, me and Kitty, we will uh, answer you guys' question. Do you guys have any questions? I will be there this Saturday at the, at the workshop. <laughs> I will be there this Saturday as well. <laughs> we have some giveaways from Wells Fargo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, one thing I want to interject, I forgot to say this. Check with homeowners or potential homeowners. Check with all the lenders. Many lenders, especially the retail lenders like the Citibank, the Chase, and the Wells Fargo, we have something called CRA requirements. We stand for Community Reinvestment Act. And so what we're doing is that we're trying to focus on lending and serving the underserved market. So I know Citibank has some sort of closing cost credit. If you are either a first-time home buyer or if you're buying in a low to moderate income census track. And there are quite a few homes in San Francisco actually meet that 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 requirement. And they will give you, I think, $7,500 closing cost credit. Again, I don't know for sure, but check with Citibank. Wells Fargo, will we're now allowing that in Alameda County, but we will be introducing San Francisco and San Mateo County that if you your income is 80% of the medium income in the county that you're buying, um, we don't set the, the medium income um, the government does, then you may be eligible for $5,000 closing cost credit. And I know Chase has something similar. So I would say it's great that, you know, check with most all your local lenders, especially the retail banks, because we are FDIC insured with different chapters. We are held to a little bit higher standard where we have to invest back in the community. So many of us right now have those special programs either earmarked for first-time home buyers and or first-time home buyers that do not make a certain income threshold. And like some banks would, depending on where you buy, they may, you might even make more, more than that. But if you buy in a particular low to income model areas that, you know, something up and coming, uh, you may be eligible for those. So please check with all your lenders. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I do have one more question that Timothy asked. Property tax, 2024 is 2%, then 2025 will be increased to 4%, then 6%. Is that how it works? No, it does not. The property tax right now 
um, for qualification purpose, I usually use 1.3% to qualify. So for example, if the purchase price of your home is 500,000, 1.3% 1 is 6,500 a year. Each installment is 3,250. So we use that number to put in the calculation to determine your debt to income ratio. Next year, your property tax will go up slightly. So instead of let's say 500,000, 1.3%, 6,500, it will go up to possibly about 66 to 6,700. So usually it's not that much. Remember the county will do the assessment. So it's not up to us, right? So if the area particularly is ticking off, then you should earmark additional. And the, again, the bigger the home that you buy, obviously the 2% represent a, a much larger dollar amount, but it usually it's not two, four, and then six. It's just a percentage of your previous year. Thank you. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and then let's see if anyone has any question. We have a few more minutes left. <laughs> um, just me say, is the section certificate eligible? Um, I'm not quite sure what you talk about. The certificate is like a first time home buyer education certificate or. Um, I'm not quite sure. Can you uh tell me more? A little bit more. What's the certificate that you are talking about? So uh, you know, you can yeah, you can actually oh. can unmute yourself and ask questions instead of tapping. So um, yeah. it may be easier for you, for everybody. Oh. Right. So so the today workshop there is a no credit for the first time home buyer program certificate. Um, if you guys like to uh get that first time home buyer education certificate, you will need to um register work orientation workshop and uh, uh, part one, part two. That is something that you can go to the homeownershipsf.org and then there's a section called home buyers. When you, when you do that, you will able to see the education Then you have to register from there. There are five agencies that are doing all the uh, first time home buyer workshop. And I see that Alex just dropped the link in the chat so you can go there to check it out. All right, no problem. So when you, you uh, we recommend you to do the two hour orientation first because the two hour orientation, you will receive all the cities program and you will know that if you are qualified and if you like to continue with the rest of the workshop. Okay, all right. And I do see that there's a, a workshop evaluation survey and there's a link. So, you know, once you guys receive the slides, uh, we encourage you guys to complete the survey so we can, you know, collect your feedback and then improve our expo for the next year as well. <laughs> Alex, are you able to jump? Oh, okay, you jump in the chat already. Perfect. <laughs> All right, and I hope everyone, you know, take a few minutes to complete it uh, for, for us to, you know, improve our